Hey YouTube, this is Jason. Let's go over some hard numbers. So the goal of this video is to help you increase your chances of getting any heart murmur questions correct on the board exam or the pack rat. And it's also a way for me to study and memorize information as well as I'm teaching it. And that helps me remember uh, information. This presentation does not cover every descriptor for heart murmurs. It will not help you get 100% of those types of questions correct, but you'll probably get most of them right if you get these charts down. If you happen to catch any errors, please leave a comment below. The methods going into this video are Mr. Taps, Murmurs by Pitch, and Toga versus Pact. Uh, Mr. Taps is based off a uh, Help Campus video that originally taught a version called Mr. Taps. Um, I just added another A to it. And the Murmurs by Pitch was developed by John Belinsky, who is a PA that does board review courses for the Pants and Pannery. And the Togo vs. Pact was developed by me to help memorize pediatric murmurs. Original links for the Help Campus and John Belinsky are right here, and they will also be provided in the information below. So what's different? I've added onto the Help Campus video and combined it with John's method based off my studies using the Pants Prep Pearl 2nd Edition, Roast Review Question Bank, and the Kaplan Question Bank. I've added a few heart sounds listed here that just kind of expands on theirs and then also develop my thing for pediatric murmurs and conditions. So let's get started. Here's what it looks like. I know it looks like a lot, but the way we build it up, it actually is not too overwhelming. I'll show you how to do that, so let's get started on that. Take this opportunity to get a pen and a piece of paper or a pencil, and we'll get started. So, Mr. Taps. This is the first thing you want to do, is divide your paper into four quadrants. Label the left side systolic and the right side diastolic. We'll add the first part of our acronym, Mr. Taps, MRT, on the bottom left corner. And uh, the, this bottom left corner here is kind of like the base of how we build this whole chart. And once we start here, it, you'll see how easy it is to build the rest of this chart without having to do rote memorization. It just kind of builds from one section to the next. So start out with the first part of Mr. Taps by writing MRT sideways here. And the rest of the acronym A-APS, that's how I have it written. First part, we always again start in the lower left corner. With the three letters here of MRT, we can really only form the abbreviations for mitral regurge and tricuspid regurge. Up here, the A-APS, we can build aortic stenosis out of the APS pulmonic stenosis, and this dash A represents atrial septal defect. Now to figure out the diastolic murmurs, it's really, really easy. All you have to do is do whatever is opposite of the systolic side. So aortic stenosis becomes aortic regurgitation. And go ahead and write aortic regurg with a space between the A and R just like this. And you'll see why in a few moments. So pulmonic stenosis will become pulmonic regurg. Mitral regurge becomes mitral stenosis, and tricuspid regurge is tricuspid stenosis. So as you can see here, we now know which murmurs fall under systolic and which ones fall under diastolic. And that was just starting off with the lower left-hand corner, building up from Mr. Taps. Next part is systolic murmurs will radiate upwards, and diastolic murmurs will radiate down. So this next part, just remember one and start in the lower left corner again. So one comes before two, A comes before B, and B comes before D. And so what does all that mean? Well, this represents your S1 heart sound, your S2 heart sound, your apex, the base of the heart, the bell of your stethoscope, and the diaphragm of your stethoscope. Meaning that these valves here the mitral and tricuspid valve form the S1 heart sound, while the pulmonic and aortic valves form the S2 heart sound. These four murmurs down here are best heard at the apex, while these four murmur or these murmurs up here are best heard at the base of the heart. 
These four rumors down here are best heard with the bell, and these ones are best heard with the diaphragm. So, one thing you should note is that, and this is kind of where a lot of my additions, along with ASD, is different from the Help Campus video, is that I added blowing into this. Now, blowing murmurs are associated with regurgitant murmurs, so that's why the arrow points only to the regurg murmurs. These four murmurs here and here are your blowing type murmurs. Draw a separation line for mitral valve prolapse. There's not really any easy way to remember it. You'll just have to remember that mitral valve prolapse, it, does, it is a systolic murmur, but it's not associated with the blowing sound. It's associated with the mid-systolic click. And on EKG, most associated EKG finding is um, pre premature ventricular contractions. Here I've added inspiration and expiration, meaning that these murmurs will become louder with either inspiration or expiration. So inspiration right, expiration is left. So why do I say that? Inspiration right, if you notice which valves are on the right side of the heart, that would be your pulmonic and tricuspid valves. And on the left side of the heart, that is your mitral and aortic valve. So inspiration right, expiration left is an easy way to remember how to write these down. Continuing on, bringing up this Y in my head reminds me of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because the second letter in systolic is Y and the second letter in hypertrophic is Y. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is associated with an S4 heart sound. Now, it is not the only murmur that is associated with an S4, but hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is associated with an S4 heart sound. Moving this H up from hypertrophic, it is a high-pitched murmur, because we're just building off the H, and then this H, bringing it down, the, the pitch or the sound of the murmur is decreased with hand grip. So you can kind of see how easy that is to remember. The Y is for hypertrophic, H for high pitch, and then coming down with hand grip. Coming back over to the diastolic side, bringing the D up in diastolic reminds me of dilated cardiomyopathy, which comes with heart failure symptoms and is associated with an S3 heart sound. Now, what else is associated with S3 heart sound? CHF is associated with the S3 heart sound. And CHF and this is not something that comes easy like building, but you'll just have to remember it, that you can have systolic dysfunction or diastolic dysfunction. And if it's systolic, they'll have a decreased ejection fraction, and if it's diastolic, the ejection fraction will be normal. Um, make a silo in your head right now is that the only two things associated with an S3 heart sound are dilated cardiomyopathy or CHF. So if you see that on a test, those are the only two things that will give you that heart sound. Okay, bringing down the A in diastolic reminds me of Austin Flint, which is associated with aortic regurgitation. So when you see Austin Flint, think aortic regurg. And the reason why we split the A and the R is because aortic regurg has a wide pulse pressure. So moving on back over to the left side, we'll draw some split arrows here that point from the S2 to atrioceptal defect. Like I said before, all of these heart sounds on the upper part of the graph is your S2 heart sound, but atrioceptal defect presents with a split and fixed S2, which is why the arrows are split. That helps remember the split and fixed S2 associated with ASD. Now ASD, you'll just have to remember this part, is also associated with a right ventricular impulse. Here we add in rheumatic heart disease. I place rheumatic heart disease in between the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve because the rheumatic heart disease can affect either the mitral or the tricuspid valve, most commonly the mitral valve. It is the most common cause for both mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis, but more commonly mitral stenosis. 
And the easy way to remember that is mitral stenosis is on top, so it is more common for rheumatic heart disease than tricuspid stenosis. Over here, I've added endocarditis because um, endocarditis will give you a, a mitral regurg sound. And endocarditis is kind of funny because it also affects the tricuspid valve. But to associate the difference, if you get a test question that involves an IV drug user, the most likely valve involved would be a tricuspid valve, and the most likely cause or etiology would be tricuspid stenosis. And then over here, it would be mitral regurg if it's acquired or congenital. Okay. Here's an explanation of infective carditis. I got this from Roche Review. As you can see, the right side most commonly affects the tricuspid valve and IV drug users. That's for right-sided endocarditis. The left-sided would be acquired or congenital, and it affects the mitral valve, giving you mitral regurg. This would be tricuspid stenosis. So let's move on to John Belinsky stuff. Um, he had a way of memorizing systolic and diastolic murmurs. What he said is in South Vietnam, there are still MIAs, so mitral insufficiency and aortic stenosis. And note that insufficiency is the same as regurgitation. Those two words can be used interchangeably. For diastolic murmurs, he said, if I aim a gun at you, you're going to die as in diastolic. So aortic insufficiency and mitral stenosis equal your diastolic murmurs. If I aim a gun at you, you're going to die. Murmurs by pitch. Again, this is accredited to John Belinsky. I've added on to it um, not much. As you can see, this is kind of how I use the MIAS and AIMS. I use it more for this. Your systolic murmurs are MIAS, and if I aim a gun at you, you're going to die. Your diastolic murmurs are on the bottom. Mitral insufficiency is a medium to high pitch murmur. Aortic stenosis is a medium pitch murmur associated with a palpable thrill. And aortic regurg is medium to high pitch murmur as well. And mitral stenosis is a medium to low pitched associated with an opening snap. So, pediatric murmurs. Here's kind of what it looks like after we build this chart up. And it's not as busy as the Mr. Taps, and it, it doesn't flow as well, but it's the best that I could come up with to make sense of all of the pediatric murmurs and conditions. This doesn't include all of the pediatric murmurs conditions. I've left out pulmonary atresia and tricuspid atresia, but I didn't know how to add those two in without making this really complicated. And again, the stuff on this chart, there's stuff missing. There's there are more things that would give you coarctation of the aorta. Um, there are more signs than this, but I put down the three that I thought were maybe the most important. Let's move on and build this chart. First, let's just write down TOGA versus PAC. Okay. Know that within this acronym that the two most common um, conditions that present with cyanosis is the transposition of the great arteries, toga, and tetralogy of Fallot, which is this T here. So those are the two out of the, all of these that more commonly present with cyanosis. So if you encounter that it has question, you can narrow it down to those two, the cyanotic infant or baby. Okay, uh, know that toga will just handle the first part of the acronym immediately and bring it down here. This is a newborn cyanotic, a uh, newborn baby that's cyanotic at birth, okay? You just have to remember that. There's no easy way to like put that into the chart. You're just gonna have to remember this. Next, draw a horizontal line and then we'll build the rest of the acronym. And just like Mr. Taps, we start in the lower left corner with VS and the upper part will be PACT, P-A-C-T. We'll go ahead and put in our murmurs. The V stands for ventricular septal defect. The S is for our stills murmur. P for patent ductus arteriosus. 
A for atrial septal defect, C for coarctation of the aorta, and T for tetralogy of Fallot. Again, starting in the lower left, A comes before B, so the lower members are best heard at the apex, and the upper ones are best heard at the base. And the reason why I didn't separate these into systolic versus diastolic because all of these are systolic. Now there's a few of them that present with both systolic and diastolic murmurs which made it really hard to figure out how to make sense of this. When I was going through the question banks I noticed that these were generally divided up and easier to distinguish by apex and base. Next step is just label these one, two, three, and four. And what does that mean? Uh, you'll find out in a second. So this is the first part. We've built this up. Let's just start with the bottom left again. Uh, ventricular septal defect is high pitch holostolic, best heard at the left lower sternal border. And if it's a large defect, it will have heart failure symptoms. Still's murmur is also high pitched and musical. So the bottom ones, you can remember that they're both high pitched and one is musical. Patent ductus arteriosus, one, what does that mean? Well, it means one continuous machine-like murmur. That's typically how it presents. Two, for atrial septal defect, well, remember that there are two S's. Two things to remember. For ASD, two S's. One, two. What does that mean? That means split and fixed S2. This is typically how atrial septal defect will present in a child. They will give you the split and fixed S2. Coarctation of the aorta. Um, there's a lot of things that would give away coarctation of the aorta. I've put down what I thought were the most important three, and I could be wrong. So if you feel like if this is incorrect, go ahead and please leave a comment and leave a suggestion on how I can make this chart better. But three, I associate with the three sign, which is a notching of the aorta on chest x-ray. So the three goes to three. And the other two things I think you should remember is that coarctation of aorta is um, associated with a bicuspid aortic valve. And hypertension in a child with the upper extremity systolic blood pressure greater than the lower extremity systolic blood pressure. Like I said before, there are other things that are involved with coarctation of the aorta not listed here. That's why I said that these charts are not 100%. They will not give you every question correct. Uh, but they will help you get most of them right. Four, tetralogy of Fallot. It's a tetralogy, tetra. So four things to remember for that is pulmonary stenosis, overriding aorta, ventricular septal defect, and right ventricular hypertrophy. Those are the four things associated with tetralogy of Fallot. I've added on the chest x-ray findings. It is a boot-shaped heart. So if you see boot-shaped heart on an exam, it is tetralogy of Fallot. You see this with any of these, that's tetralogy of Fallot. Again, just a reminder, ventricular septal defect is part of tetralogy of Fallot, so they can also have these symptoms. And also, patent ductus arteriosus is also seen in tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, but more importantly, the patent ductus arteriosus is needed to be open. It needs to be remained open in order for someone with tetralogy flow to survive. That is important. The condition in which you would see PDA in tetralogy of flow is called Eisenmenger syndrome, but more importantly, PDA is needed to stay open in order for someone with TOF to survive. So let's go over some example questions now that we have our charts built up. These questions came straight from the question banks that I study from. And some of them are really long, I didn't write them, They're just that's just how they were written, so bear with me. How this is going to work is that I am going to just go ahead and show the question, and just for me to save time on the video, I'm just going to ask that you pause it, read through the question, come up with an answer, because all I'm going to do is show the answer and then explain how to use the chart and explain the answer immediately. Once the question pops up, go ahead and just pause it, and then once you have an answer, go ahead and unpause it and you'll see the explanation for it. So question one. Okay, this question is asking you uh, 
which valves produce the S2 heart sound? And the answer is aortic and pulmonic valves. If you look at our chart in Mr. Taps, you just find your S2 heart sound and you'll see that it is your pulmonic valve and your aortic valve. The answer to this one is diastolic dysfunction. There's a few things in this question kind of leading you to the right from Right off the bat, you'll notice that there's an S3 heart sound. And remember I told you before, the only two things that give you an S3 heart sound are dilated cardiomyopathy and CHF. This 60-year-old woman is showing signs of CHF, not on our chart, but the prominent precordial impulse and the chest radiograph ruling a prominent left ventricular shadow. Those are signs of CHF. And what they're asking is what diagnosis is causing this presentation. And they give us a normal ventricular ejection fraction. So we know that it's S3. We know that it's one of these two. She is showing signs of CHF. So we go to CHF. We look for the systolic and diastolic dysfunction. She has a normal ejection fraction. So she's going to have diastolic dysfunction. The answer to this is patent ductus arteriosus, and the dead giveaway is the continuous murmur in the upper left sternal border. You look at our chart here, patent ductus arteriosus, one continuous machine-like murmur. The answer to this question is tricuspid insufficiency. In the question, they gave us a blowing hollow systolic murmur in a newborn. You could be quick to go to the pediatric for murmurs, but blowing hollow systolic is not helpful. It's not on that chart. This is blowing, and it's systolic. So that's going to narrow it down to mitral regurge or tricuspid regurge. The other thing that this question is testing you on are your cardiac landmarks when doing cardiac examination. When you're auscultating someone's chest, your aortic landmark is on the right, pulmonic and tricuspid are on the left, and your mitral's the fifth intercostal space over here. This question kind of gives that away because it says it's heard loudest at the left sternal border. Since we have it narrowed down using the Mr. Taps chart to um, tricuspid regurge, we know it's blowing hollow systolic. It's one of these two. And they give you left sternal border. The only one that makes sense out of those answers is tricuspid insufficiency because the mitral landmark is not on the left sternal border. The answer to this question is aortic regurgitation. I put this question in here because it was tricky. If you're just using the charts alone, if you jump to the first one, it's a low-pitched diastolic murmur. Best heard at the apex, so your apex, mitral stenosis, low pitch, yes, mitral stenosis, but it's blowing. And the second part, it's blowing. So it's blowing, and it's heard of the left sternal border, and it has a wide pulse pressure. They give you two separate descriptions, which could lead you to two different answers, and both choices are on the question, mitral stenosis and aortic regurge. Because they give the wide pulse pressure, and the blowing, I'm gonna. I went with aortic regurge. That's the one I'm going with. But like I said before, that this question I put in because it's a good example of how the charts aren't 100%, and you're they're not gonna get you 100% on cardiac murmurs. They will get you most of them. The answer to this question is aortic valve stenosis. This one is also a little tricky because it's a four-year-old. And you're quick to maybe, oh, it's a, it's a child. Let's go to the pediatric chart. Is there anything on the pediatric chart? Systolic ejection murmur with the prominent systolic ejection click. There's nothing on this chart that will help you find the right answer. None of those descriptors are in this chart. You can also use Mr. Taps. They're giving you both systolic and a diastolic description. So Mr. Taps isn't even really helpful. So again, this is another question. 
which just using the charts is not going to be helpful. It's why I put it in here. Both murmurs are heard best at the upper right sternal border, and the only landmark on the upper right sternal border is the aortic landmark. Just based off of that, and one of the descriptors is systolic and aortic, well, that only gives me one answer on the systolic side, which is aortic stenosis. This was kind of a tricky question. I put it in there on purpose. It kind of threw me for a loop when I encountered it on the question bank, but when you read the explanations, the fact that it is on the upper right sternal border is the giveaway for aortic stenosis. This one is a mid-systolic click. This one's pretty easy. You just find mitral valve prolapse on the chart, and mid-systolic click is the answer. The answer to this one is atrioseptal defect. There's a few things in here that give this away. Prominent right ventricular cardiac impulse, ASDs associated with the RV impulse, and there's a wide and fixed splitting of the second heart sound. That is atrioseptal defect according to our chart, and that is the answer. The answer to this question is the diastolic low pitch decrease the member best heard at the cardiac apex. So how do you figure this one out? Well, you kind of have to know the signs and symptoms of rheumatic heart disease, which this person has. You have to kind of know the risk factors as well. She's pregnant and she's from an underdeveloped country with fever, which is all indicative of rheumatic heart disease. So if you can figure that part out, all you have to do is go to our chart, find rheumatic heart disease, and like I said before, rheumatic heart disease affects both the tricuspid and the mitral valve, but since mitral valve is on the top, it is the, the more common one, so we're going to go with mitral stenosis on this. And if you look at our chart, it is a diastolic murmur, it is low-pitched, and it's best heard at the apex. And so out of all the descriptions, that's the one that most makes the most sense for, for rheumatic heart disease. The answer to this is right ventricular hypertrophy. Again, this is a little bit of a tricky one as well. We need to figure out what the murmur is first before we can actually figure out the answer. This is a low pitch apical late diastolic murmur. So diastolic low pitch, this is mitral stenosis. There's going to be back pressure in the left atrium which will back up the pulmonary system and eventually make the right ventricle work a little bit harder. And if the right ventricle is working harder to pump blood through the pulmonary system because of the backup, due to this mitral stenosis, it's going to get hypertrophy. It's going to build up. And so you're, you'll have right ventricular hypertrophy with this one. The answer to this one is a patent ductus arteriosus. Right away, you can see this is a cyanotic infant. So if you go to our chart here, we know that the two most common presentations of cyanosis in a child is transposition of the great arteries or tetralogy of Fallot. This is not a neonate or newborn that's cyanotic at birth. We can rule out transposition of the great arteries. That leaves us with tetralogy of Fallot. Tetralogy of Fallot has all of these things that are listed in the question, pulmonary stenosis, overriding or ventricular septal defect, right ventricular hypertrophy, and also patent ductus arteriosus is needed to be open in order for them to survive. And that's why that's on the chart. So, uh, The answer to this one is acute mitral regurgitation. They tell you in the question that this person was just recently discharged with endocarditis. So on our chart, you just need to find endocarditis. Is he an IV drug user? No. So most likely it's not tricuspid stenosis. It's most likely mitral regurg because, as I said before, endocarditis with tricuspid valve involvement, tricuspid stenosis is usually an IV drug user. In this case, non-IV non drug user, it's acquired um, mitral regurg, acute mitral regurg is the answer. The answer to this one is aortic insufficiency. There is a 
blowing diastolic murmur heard loudest at the left sternal border. So blowing diastolic murmur, that would give us aortic insufficiency according to our chart. They, they, they do throw in some other things like the S3 heart sound, which you could go dilated cardiomyopathy or CHF, which but none of those are our choices. Um, pulmonic regurge could also be an option, but that is not an answer choice. So the only choice that makes sense is aortic regurge in this question. Answer to this one is mitral stenosis. You can do this just based off of pitch. It's a low pitch diastolic murmur with an opening snap. So you go over to the pitch, diastolic murmur, low pitch, opening snap, that gives you mitral stenosis. You could use Mr. Taps as well because um, they say it's best heard over the apex. So you can confirm it's best over the apex, mitral stenosis. The answer this is tricuspid valve. They kind of give it away with the IV drug user, okay? IV drug user, you suspect endocarditis. Uh, endocarditis, IV drug user, that's tricuspid valve involvement, tricuspid stenosis. My answer to this is tetralogy of Fallot. The kid is cyanotic. Cyanosis in a pediatric patient is either toga, Transmission of the Great Arteries, or Tetralogy of Fallot. This is a 15-month-old boy. It is not a newborn that is cyanotic at birth. So just with this, you can go straight to TOF. Now, there are other things in here that are giveaways for Tetralogy of Fallot, like squatting makes them feel better. The cyanosis that gets better, that's all signs of Tetralogy of Fallot that's not on our chart. But like I said, if I put everything on here, this would be very complicated. So I try to keep it simple, try to keep it down to the most common things to help figure out long questions like this. The answer to this is rheumatic heart disease. Most common cause of tricuspid stenosis is rheumatic heart disease, according to our chart. It is also the most common cause of mitral stenosis as well, but mitral stenosis is not a choice. So we're going to go with tricuspid. Tricuspid stenosis is the answer to this one. It's diastolic rumbling murmur. Rumbling doesn't really help us here, but it's best heard with the bell. So that brings us down here over the left sternal border at the fourth intercostal space. So this is also testing your knowledge of the cardiac landmarks on chest auscultation again. This is uh, mitral valve disease. Again, this is your ability to detect the signs and symptoms of rheumatic heart disease and knowing the Jones criteria. If you don't know what that is, you can look it up. You'll see that within this question, this child meets two major criteria of the Jones criteria, which would help you find the answer on this chart. Like I said before, rheumatic heart disease generally affects the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve, uh, more commonly the mitral valve. The answer to this one is aortic regurg. It is diastolic and high-pitched, so just based off the pitch chart, diastolic, high-pitched, that is aortic regurg. You can use Mr. Taps because it's diastolic and blowing, so that's also going to bring you into, narrow it down to at least aortic regurge, pulmonic regurge, Mr. Taps. This is mitral stenosis. Again, just with the pitch chart, it's a low pitch diastolic murmur. Diastolic low pitch, that's mitral stenosis. Left lateral decubitus position, yes, that is also mitral stenosis, but it's not on our charts because I didn't want to put too much on the charts. Um, also, they give us the opening snap, which is also on the pitch chart.
the answer to this is transposition of the great arteries. Again, this is a uh, child, baby, infant, cyanosis. We go straight over here. Toga versus pact. Toga is cyanosis. Tetralogy of flow, cyanosis. Toga is a newborn cyanotic at birth. This is a neonate within minutes of birth that is cyanotic. So you could jump straight to transposition of the great arteries. Um, there are other things in the question that give away Toga, but again, I tried to keep the chart simple, and as you can see, it, it does help narrow it down to the right answer. Mitral valve regurge, okay? They're just asking you, what does it sound like? So you just find mitral regurge here. It's a blowing systolic murmur, best heard at the apex, best heard with the bell. Do we have that on here? Blowing hollow systolic murmur in an S1 heart sound. That's the only answer that makes sense with mitral regurge. Answer this is Tetralogy of Fallot. Again, this is a just, you go straight to our chart. Cyanosis in a child. It's not a baby. It's a five-month-old girl. We go straight to Tetralogy of Fallot. Another giveaway for Tetralogy of Fallot is that they had cyanosis and then became normal. That is also a sign of Tetralogy of Fallot. The systolic murmur doesn't give us, like I said, all of these are systolic. That doesn't help us. This is mitral valve prolapse. It's a young girl with a systolic click. So that would be mitral valve prolapse. Those give it away. Mitral stenosis, again, rumbling mid diastolic murmur, diastolic murmur with an opening snap. That's mitral stenosis just based off the pitch chart. And you can use Mr. Taps because they do give you a location as well. Answer to this is widened pulse pressure. First, we need to figure out what it is. He had rheumatic heart disease as a child, but more importantly, you have a diastolic murmur and it's blowing. So it's diastolic and blowing. That's going to leave you with aortic regurge or pulmonic regurge. So this is one of those 50-50 questions. I'm sure there's other things in here that would lead you to um, aortic regurge. But like I said, these charts aren't 100%. You're going to have to know some other background information too. Like I said, these will get you through most of the murmur type questions, but not all of them. Atroceptal defect. They give you the split and fixed S2, which is on our chart, and on Mr. Taps, which is the chart's not up, but there is a right ventricular uh, impulse. That is also part of ASD. Answer this is dilated cardiomyopathy, an S3 heart sound, which is either dilated cardiomyopathy or CHF, a jugular venous distension. They have the heart failure symptoms with the S3, but what kind of gives this away is she's an alcoholic. You just have to know that. Dilated cardiomyopathy is associated with alcoholics as well. Alcoholic, S3, heart failure symptoms, dilated cardiomyopathy. And CHF is not a choice either, as far as your answers are concerned. Tetralogy of Fallot, again, a two-month-old, presenting with cyanosis, not a baby. So rule out toga, straight to Tetralogy of Fallot. Are there other things in here that give it away? Yes, there are. But those aren't on the chart. After going through all this stuff, I did recognize that these are the two most common that present with cyanosis and the types of patients that they generally affect. Aortic stenosis is this one. This is a systolic murmur that radiates upward. And it's also heard at the right second intercostal space, which is your aortic landmark. So systolic murmur radiates up at the second intercostal space. That's aortic stenosis. 
And crescendo, decrescendo, yes, that's also part of aortic stenosis, but it's not the only one that has crescendo, decrescendo, which is why I didn't put it on here. This one we know is mitral valve prolapse because of the mid-systolic click. Premature ventricular contractions is associated with mitral valve prolapse, and it is one of our answer choices here. Here is decreased murmur with hand grips. You have to identify that this patient has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is how you would figure out this answer. And they give that away by saying it reveals a thickened ventricular septum. Now, it's tricky because typically hypertrophic cardiomyopathy presents in a young person who suddenly collapsed on a field. It's usually a, a young athlete. They gave you a 55-year-old man maybe trying to throw you off the scent of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but it's a dead giveaway if you know what it is a thickened ventricular septum, then you know it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And if you go to our chart, hypertrophic is high pitch and it's decreased with hand grip. And that is our answer here. They kind of give this one away. They tell you it's rheumatic fever. And as I mentioned before, rheumatic fever, the valve most likely affected is the mitral valve. It's more commonly affected than the tricuspid valve. This is testing whether or not if you know your landmarks again. So do you know where to put your stethoscope when listening to these heart sounds? So the mitral valve landmark or the mitral landmark is the left fifth intercostal space. This is coarctation of the aorta. There's a few things in here that give this away. Specifically on our chart, the three sign notching of the aorta and chest x-ray, I think they did give that to us. Chest x-ray shows a narrowed notched aorta, yeah, so that's coarctation of the aorta. They also gave you the blood pressures. So they gave us the systolic blood pressures higher in the upper extremities than it is in the lower extremities. And there's other things that give away coarctation of the aorta in here. The failure to thrive is in the fifth percentile for height and weight child's not eating well, and then along with the blood pressure, there, there's all the signs and symptoms of tetralogy or, or sorry, coarctation of the aorta in here. And um, like I said, I didn't put all of those on here because it would just be too much to remember. Um, so I put the three things that I thought were most important. If you feel like that's incorrect, let me know. I can make changes and redo this. That's it. Uh, thanks for your time. I hope that this video helped. Again, this video was based off of the Health Campus video, original video of Mr. Taft, and John Belinsky's information in his Pants Board Review course. You can see their YouTube videos right here. I combined the two methods, uh, and I based that off of my Roche Review question bank, the Kaplan question bank, and the Pants Pearls book, uh, second edition. If you're interested in buying either one of those question bank, you can purchase them at the links here, which will be provided below. Any mistakes uh, or errors found, please leave a comment. All right, have a good day.